The Healer, The Healing Work of Mary Baker Eddy Compiled and Arranged by David Keeston Part 4, Fifth Continuation Number 110 Clara E. Choet, in her Reminiscences, relates what it was like to take part in the meetings of the early Christian scientists at this time, and how Mrs. Eddy's provoking of thought brought about wonderful progress and healing, and above all, caused her students to think. The power of this truth thus uttered by her was not lost upon the students, and was more or less felt by all present. One said she had come with a headache, another with a fear of spine, another with throat and cough, and so each one, thinking of their troubles, suddenly found the air changed, and their conditions also changed to their immediate consciousness of relief from evil. From Psalms Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Number 111 At another time in Lynn, Mrs. Choet was suffering from what she believed to be diphtheria, the symptoms were such as are commonly shown by a bad case of that disease. She was a Christian scientist, and two other Christian scientists besides herself had failed to heal her. Then Mrs. Eddy, on being called to save Mrs. Choet's life, healed her by one treatment. As Mrs. Choet afterward wrote, our beloved leader, Mrs. Eddy, came to my bedside and healed me of a terrible attack of diphtheria instantly. Number 112 An article entitled Mind Cure that appeared in the June 14, 1879 edition of The Peabody Reporter issued forth another testimony of the power of spirit, God, as reflected by this great lady. It was offered in evidence that a young woman who had been afflicted with softening of the brain from her earliest childhood until she was twenty-six years old had been wholly cured by the exercise of Mrs. Eddy's mind cure, so that now she was able to fill the position of a school teacher. Number 113. Mrs. Eddy told a student in her home, Miss Lane, the following regarding the doctrines of men, and in so doing related perhaps the only instance where she did not heal. Ralph Waldo Emerson was a man fitting a niche in history well, and we all in Massachusetts love him. But he was as far from accepting Christian science as a man can be who is a strict moralist. Bronson Alcott is far in advance of him. I saw Emerson some months before his demise, went for the purpose of healing him. Let no one but my husband, Dr. Eddy, who went with me, know it. As soon as I got into the deep recesses of his thoughts, I saw his case was hopeless. I can work only by God's graces and by his rules. So, when I said in reply to his remark, I am old and my brains are wearing out from hard labor, and then chattered like a babe. But you believe in the powers of God above all causation, do you not? He answered, Yes, and this followed in substance, 
but it would be profane for me to believe a man does not wear out. I don't believe God can or wants to prevent this result of old age. Now, Miss L., what would this be for an item of history that normal-class students from the only college or school in our land, teaching the supremacy of mind over all error, should relapse into studying the ethics of one who died in that belief? Can you find in any work as good a system of hygiene? Do you understand all that work? If you do not, then it is your bounden duty to do it. And if you wish to graduate at my college under the seal of the state of Massachusetts, you must know this great textbook sufficiently to be examined in it throughout before you can receive a diploma and graduate at the only chartered mind-healing college on earth, Massachusetts Metaphysical College. From Matthew A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there, because of their unbelief. Number 114 Mrs. Eddy's son, George Glover, from her first marriage to her husband of the same name, would on occasion visit her, as he lived far from Boston. George's daughter, Mrs. Billings, had, in 1934, an interesting healing to relate. During the fall and winter of 1879 and 1880, when we lived at Deadwood, South Dakota, and I was three years old, my father went to visit his mother in Boston. At that time, my eyes were what is termed crossed, and during his visit he told Grandmother about them. According to my father, Grandmother said, You must be mistaken, George. Her eyes are all right. When he returned to our home in Deadwood, and during a conversation with my mother at my bedside while I was asleep, they awakened me and discovered that my eyes had become straightened. Mother has a picture of me taken before this incident, showing my eyes crossed. This healing was often told me by my father and mother, and is at this time verified by my mother, who was with me. From Science and Health Christian science separates error from truth and breathes through the sacred pages the spiritual sense of life, substance, and intelligence. In this science, we discover man in the image and likeness of God. We see that man has never lost his spiritual estate and his eternal harmony. Number 115. In 1880, the Eddies moved to a house on Shawmut Avenue in Boston, along with the Chowets, early interested students of Christian science. George Chowett would be away much of the time in establishing his healing practice in Portland, Maine. However, he would ask Mrs. Eddy questions regarding certain cases he had. On one occasion, he asked Mrs. Eddy about a case that he had had trouble healing. Mrs. Eddy addressed the case mentally. In metaphysical healing, distance is no impediment to the infinite ability of God to heal, and told George that the belief that needed to be addressed was due to a fall that the patient had taken several years previous. Number 
the unerring accuracy of Mrs. Eddy's spiritual assessment was immediately confirmed in a letter written to her upon Mrs. Choate's return to Portland. April 2nd, 1880 Last Saturday, when I was at home, and you examined my patient mentally, she had the most wonderful chemical, or something of the kind, that I ever heard of. She was sitting, talking with some ladies, and felt a little faint, her head ached, and she said she would go to bed, when she felt a crash, just as when she was thrown from a carriage, and knew nothing for four hours. Great black and blue spots, just where she was bruised years ago when she fell, appeared, and she acted and talked like a person under the influence of morphine. After the discoloration was gone, the cuticle came off in scales, and she is better than ever now and walks without a cane, has been out to ride today. What can it be? What does it mean? G. D. Choate. Of course, Mrs. Eddy's realization of man's present perfection and her mental detection and correction of the belief harbored by the patient brought about immediate healing results. From Science and Health Christian science brings to the body the sunlight of truth, which invigorates and purifies. Christian science acts as an alterative, neutralizing error with truth. It changes the secretions, expels humors, dissolves tumors, relaxes rigid muscles, restores carious bones to soundness. The effect of this science is to stir the human mind to a change of base, on which it may yield to the harmony of the divine mind. Number 116 Mrs. Eddy's ability to discern thought spiritually was made evident on many, many occasions. She was able to read thought as easily as we might read a newspaper. However, her motive in so doing was always to bless the recipient. Miss Julia Bartlett and Dr. Eddy went through Mrs. Eddy's first class at 569 Columbus Avenue. Afterwards, Mrs. Eddy moved to 571, and Miss Bartlett went to stay with her there. This was before the charter for the Massachusetts Metaphysical College was obtained. There were several others in the class, but Miss Bartlett and Dr. Eddy were the two who had previously received class instruction from Mrs. Eddy. Mrs. Eddy told them she had to answer their questions first before she came to the others. They had not asked any questions, but Mrs. Eddy felt their thought. In this class or another, Miss Bartlett had some phase of science which she was studying in her mind. Mrs. Eddy started in asking questions of each member of the class in turn, different questions. When she came to Miss Bartlett, she asked her a question on the subject she had been studying over. Miss Bartlett then saw that she had been sounding each one separately on the query in his own mind as she went through the class with her questions. From Science and Health All we correctly know of spirit comes from God, divine principle, and is learned through Christ and Christian science. 
If this science has been thoroughly learned and properly digested, we can know the truth more accurately than the astronomer can read the stars or calculate an eclipse. This mind-reading is the opposite of clairvoyance. It is the illumination of the spiritual understanding which demonstrates the capacity of soul, not of material sense. This soul sense comes to the human mind when the latter yields to the divine mind. Such intuitions reveal whatever constitutes and perpetuates harmony, enabling one to do good but not evil. You will reach the perfect science of healing when you are able to read the human mind after this manner and discern the error you would destroy. The Samaritan woman said, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Number 117 the period that saw Mrs. Eddy in Lynn was probably the most prolific period of her healing career. It has been said that Lynn resounded with her cures. One constantly heard of her success in curing the incurable, and always the healing was instantaneous. In mid-1880, Mrs. Eddy healed a young man named Hanover P. Smith. For nineteen years since his birth, Hanover's mother had exhausted every medical means possible to cure her son of being deaf and dumb. In the institution where he was kept, the doctors pronounced him incurable. Finally, his mother took him to Mrs. Eddy who healed him quickly. Afterward, he became an active member of the Church of Christ Scientist. For many years after his healing, he attended services and gave testimonies in the Mother Church. From Mark When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Number 118 Another reminiscence of Julia Bartlett's was of the first Christian science service which she attended in the parlor of Mrs. Eddy's home. There were about twenty people present. Mrs. Eddy preached the sermon which healed a young woman sitting near me of an old chronic trouble which physicians were unable to heal. Her husband, who was present with her, went to Mrs. Eddy the next day to thank her for what had been done for his wife. From Science and Health Christianity is the basis of true healing. Whatever holds human thought in line with unselfed love receives directly the divine power. Number 119 I was once called to visit a sick man. 
to whom the regular physicians had given three doses of croton oil and then had left him to die. Upon my arrival, I found him barely alive and in terrible agony. In one hour, he was well, and the next day he attended to his business. I removed the stoppage, healed him of enteritis, and neutralized the bad effects of the poisonous oil. His physicians had failed even to move his bowels, though the wonder was, with the means used in their effort to accomplish this result, that they had not quite killed him. According to their diagnosis, the exciting cause of the inflammation and stoppage was eating smoked herring. The man is living yet, and I will send his address to anyone who may wish to apply to him for information about his case. Number 120. In front of Mrs. Eddy's home, a good many years ago, out on the highway, a man was one day run over by a very heavily laden wagon, from which he had fallen, the wheels passing across his body. The teamster was thought dead, and the body was brought into her home and laid on the floor. Mrs. Eddy was upstairs at the time, and they besought her to come down. My remembrance is that she hesitated at first, but finally came down, and looking away from the body, began to declare the truth, and had such a wonderful sense of mental uplift that she became entirely oblivious to her surroundings. After spending some moments in this spiritual contemplation of truth, she suddenly came to herself and found that the man had risen. Passing his hand over his eyes in a somewhat dazed way, he said, Why, I thought I was hurt, but I am all right. From Science and Health Experiments have favored the fact that mind governs the body, not in one instance, but in every instance. The indestructible faculties of spirit exist without the conditions of matter, and also without the false beliefs of a so-called material existence. Working out the rules of science in practice, the author has restored health in cases of both acute and chronic disease in their severest forms. Secretions have been changed, the structure has been renewed, shortened limbs have been elongated, ankylosed joints have been made supple, and carious bones have been restored to healthy conditions. Number 121. There were many instances of healings recounted in her classes, in addition to healings of students that took place in class. Julia Bartlett remembers an interesting moment in class, which commenced September 30th, 1880. When the class was through, my friend, Mrs. Ellen Clark, who first told me of Christian science, and who was also in the class, and I lingered a little, and were sitting beside our dear teacher, while she was talking to us of mortal mind's hatred of truth and the evil to be overcome. She mentioned an incident of a person coming to her door armed against her, but he was not able to perform his evil work. We were seeing a little of what it meant for her to stand where she did, a representative of truth before a world of error, the cost of it and the glory of it. 
but we said in a playful, childlike way that amused and comforted her, They shall not touch you. We will help you. My greatest joy today is that I may have been the means of lightening her burdens somewhat in the years that followed. From Psalms I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Number 122. The thirteen-year-old daughter of a Boston family had a growth on her neck which was so large that she could not turn her head without turning her entire body. Mrs. Eddy was asked to help. The growth disappeared, leaving no trace, excepting for a scar where the doctor had lanced it previously. Number 123 Student's Account of a Victory Over Death by Mrs. Eddy Mrs. Eddy became aware of a baby who lived across the street, and one morning she noticed the doctor's carriage leaving the home of the child. Mrs. Eddy went over to the house, spoke with the mother, and asked to see the child. The mother said, the child had passed on while the doctor was there. Mrs. Eddy went and sat beside the child, realizing the truth of being as no one else has since the time of Jesus. And the child was healed. Instead of gratitude being expressed by the mother, she took the child and showed much resentment towards Mrs. Eddy. The child remained well. From Science and Health If we are ungrateful for life, truth, and love, and yet return thanks to God for all blessings, we are insincere and incur the sharp censure our Master pronounces on hypocrites. In such a case, the only acceptable prayer is to put the finger on the lips and remember our blessings. While the heart is far from divine truth and love, we cannot conceal the ingratitude of barren lives. Jesus endured the shame that he might pour his dear-bought bounty into barren lives. What was his earthly reward? He was forsaken by all, save John, the beloved disciple, and a few women who bowed in silent woe beneath the shadow of his cross. The earthly price of spirituality in a material age and the great moral distance between Christianity and sensualism preclude Christian science from finding favor with the worldly-minded. Number 124 In line with this lesson on mesmerism, a student records that she once told Mrs. Eddy she had healed a boy run into by a train. Mrs. Eddy asked how she had treated the case. And the response was, I just knew that I could not be mesmerized. 
her teacher applauded the recognition that I is all that is involved, adding, that is all you ever have to do. From Science and Health When speaking of God's children, not the children of men, Jesus said, The kingdom of God is within you. That is, truth and love reign in the real man, showing that man in God's image is unfallen and eternal. Jesus beheld in science the perfect man, who appeared to him, where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. In this perfect man, the Savior saw God's own likeness, and this correct view of man healed the sick. Thus Jesus taught that the kingdom of God is intact, universal, and that man is pure and holy. Number 125 Mrs. Eddy's correspondence with her students, as well as their later reminiscences, provides scores of examples of her ability to sense currents of thought and troublesome situations, of which she had no explicit knowledge. Although she repudiated clairvoyance in the usual psychic meaning of the word, she did believe that spiritual intuition should forewarn one of special needs that required one's attention. Susie M. Lang, who was in her class of May 1882, tells of receiving a message from her later that summer, saying, If you cannot come to me, I shall go to you. On turning up, Miss Lang was amazed to discover that Mrs. Eddy had sensed her sharp need in a situation of which she, Mrs. Eddy, had no knowledge and had reached out at once to help her. From Ezekiel And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Number 126 In one of Mrs. Eddy's classes, there was a woman who had a strong sense of resentment and condemnation toward her husband, who was very immoral. Mrs. Eddy said to her that Jesus healed the Magdalene by condemning the sin, but not the woman. The lady answered, Yes, but I have not the consciousness that Jesus had. Our leader instantly rebuked this by saying that she could claim the Christ consciousness, for otherwise she could not heal a single case of sin or sickness. The student's consciousness was so illuminated that her state of mind completely changed toward her husband and when she returned home, she found her husband healed. From John And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Number 
and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. 